Welcome to the Folktale Project, this is Dan Charles. Today we have the penultimate tale from Legends of the Rhine, and this is another famous one, made famous by Richard Wagner and his opera of the same name. And that also means that it's time to vote for the next book that we read from, the Topaz Storybook or the Red Fairy Book. Head over to folktaleproject.com now to vote. This is Lohengrin. The weathercock on the ancient stronghold at Cleve is a swan, and in olden times the dynasty that ruled over the lovely country round Cleve also had a swan in their crest. A legend, tragic and beautiful, preserved to posterity forever in Richard Wagner's lovely opera, is connected with it, the legend of Lohengrin. Long centuries ago, deep sorrow brooded over the walls of the castle at Cleve. Its mistress, the Duchess Elsa, was in great distress. Her beloved husband had died, and his remains had been brought to their last resting place. As soon as the tomb had closed over them, one of the late duke's vassals, Telramund, rose in revolt and imperiously claimed the right to reign over the dukedom. The audacious man went so far as to ask the widowed duchess to become his wife, declaring that this was the only means of saving her rank, which the death of her husband had deprived her of. Elsa, the youthful and lovely mistress, implored the knights of her dominion to assist her in her trouble and to take up arms against the rebel. But Telramund, little disconcerted by this appeal, offered to fight in single combat with anybody who dared to take up the quarrel with him, well knowing that on account of his immense strength nobody would dare to become his adversary. The days passed in deepest sorrow for the unfortunate Duchess. The moment was approaching when the rebel would make bold to proclaim openly his claims before the whole assembled nobility on the open space before the castle. The fatal hour came. Pale, her face covered by her widow's veil, her queenly form enveloped in mourning garments, Elsa descended from her castle to the assembly. The large plain was crowded with a throng of people, and glittered with the brilliant armor of the knights. The unfaithful vassal, covered from head to foot in shining armor, came forward with bold steps and claimed in a loud voice the hand and dominion of the duchess. The knights around, deluded by his valiant appearance and the firmness of his voice, broke into loud applause. Some of the crowd joined them in their cry of approbation, but most of the people looked on, full of pity and admiration for their youthful mistress. No answer to his first challenge having come, Telramund repeated his audacious demand, offering again to fight in single combat anybody who dared to accept it. His eyes glanced defiantly over the brilliant multitude of knights. He perceived with triumphant joy how they all shrank from fighting with him. Elsa looked still paler than before. For a third time the challenge of Telramund was heard. It sounded clearly over the whole plain, but none of the bright warriors came forward to take up the combat for Elsa's sake. On the contrary, deep silence followed the third challenge, and everybody's eyes were fixed on the forsaken princess who looked in her abandoned position still more lovely. The little hope that had till that moment given her strength to bear her misfortune had now entirely vanished. In her utter desolation she offered a fervent prayer to heaven. On her rosary, so the legend records, A little silver bell was hanging, which possessed the wonderful gift of giving forth whenever lightly touched, a clear ringing sound audible even at a great distance. In praying to God for deliverance from her great trouble, she pressed the cross on her rosary fervently to her lips. The silver bell tinkled, and at the same moment a little barge suddenly appeared on the blue river. When it came near, everybody looked with astonishment at the strange vessel. Its form was light and graceful, but what astonished the people most was that it was not moved by either oar or rudder, but it was gently gliding on the blue waves drawn by a snow-white swan. In the middle of the vessel stood a knight in shining silver armor. Long golden locks emerged from under his glittering helmet. 
His bright blue eyes looked boldly over the crowd on the shore, and his hand held the hilt of his broad sword firmly. The strange boat stopped just opposite the plain where the people stood motionless with amazement. The knight landed from the barge, giving a sign with his hand to the swan which swam gently down the Rhine. In silence and awe the multitude made room for the stranger, who approached with firm steps towards the middle of the brilliant circle and saluted the assembly with a solemn grace. Then he bent his knee before the duchess and rising, turned towards Telramund, challenging him proudly to fight with him for the hand and dominion of Elsa of Brabant. The bold rebel's temerity seemed to fail him for a few moments, but gathering fresh courage, he pulled his sword from its sheath and with a loud, scornful laugh. The next moment the two knights darted at each other, their blades clashing in rapid strokes. The whole crowd looked with wonder and amazement at the strange knight's great prowess. He parried the blows of his strong adversary skillfully. The combat lasted for some time, and neither of the fighters seemed to give way. Suddenly, a subdued cry was heard, and at the same time the presumptuous vassal sank to the ground pierced by the sword of him whom God had sent and expired. A tremendous shout of joy burst from the gazing crowd, which rang from one end of the plain to the other and was echoed by the glittering waves of the Rhine. The people rejoiced in the victory, and thought that God himself had decided the combat in favor of Elsa. The Duchess felt greatly moved. In her overflowing gratitude she sank down before her deliverer with tears in her eyes, but he bade her rise, and bowing low before her, he asked her to become his wife. She consented. What a heaven of bliss opened for the Duchess of Brabant! All her former troubles were forgotten. Her gratitude towards her rescuer was transformed into passionate love, to which Lohengrin, the virtuous knight, responded with tender adoration. Yet. Though everything seemed now so serene in the life of the Duchess, there was a dim cloud which threatened to darken the clear prospect of her happiness. On their wedding day, Elsa had to promise her bridegroom that she would never inquire about his name, his home, or his descent. Trusting her deliverer's honor and chivalrous bearing, she took the strange oath without a moment's hesitation. Many years of bliss and happiness passed, and Elsa of Brabant had strictly kept the promise she had made on her bridal morning. Their happiness was still more enhanced by the birth of three hopeful boys. They were their parents' joy, and promised to become in future shining ornaments of knighthood. It happened, however, when the eyes of the Duchess were resting with pride on her sons, that her mother's heart thought with grief of the solemn oath she had sworn on her wedding day. With how much more pride would she have looked upon her sons if she could have known them to be the offspring of a high and noble race? She did not doubt, however, that her beloved husband's lineage was a most noble one. Yet the thought that his sons might never bear their father's name, nor be able to add new glories to it, was lying heavily on her mind and darkened the radiant image of her husband that, like a deity, filled her whole soul. The fatal question she had for so long withheld burst one day forcibly from her lips. When she had pronounced the awful words, the proud hero grew pale, and freeing himself softly from her tender embrace, he cried out in bitter grief, Woe to thee, my beloved wife, and woe also to me! Now that thou hast uttered the question, thou didst swear solemnly never to ask, our happiness is gone for ever. I must depart from thee never to see thee again. A cry of anguish rose from her lips, but she was unable to keep him back. Waving his hand to her in a mute farewell, her noble husband left the castle. He went to the Rhine and blew his silver horn. Its sound was echoed from the shore like a long sob. The white swan with the boat soon appeared gliding gently over the river. Lohengrin stepped into the boat, and soon vanished out of sight, and was seen no more. His unhappy wife was inconsolable. Her grief was so intense that a short time after her health gave way, and she sank into a premature grave. Her sons became the ancestors of a noble and distinguished race in the Rhenish country. Their badge is a swan. The traveler who visits Cleve will still find a tombstone in its church, 
with a knight carved on it, and a swan sitting at his feet. And that is the story of Lohengrin, a tale that, you know, it comes from other works of art. It has sources in Parzival and is actually where we get the bridal chorus, known to those of us in the English-speaking worlds as Here Comes the Bride, the processional at many, many weddings. This is Dan Schultz for the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com, where you'll we'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And don't forget to head over to folktaleproject.com to vote for the next book that we read. As always, thank you so much for listening.